What's up? Welcome to the only YouTube channel on the internet. Today, I am going over the last like 25 chapters of the Dressrosa arc. I'm once again switching up the structure of this video because my god, that last Dressrosa video was way too long. 50 minutes is too much. I also just feel like I didn't have enough interesting things to say going beat by beat through the story. So I found a happy medium this time and I read through everything and then I just like took a bunch of notes of all the high points that I wanted to talk about and I'm going to go over those and hopefully it won't literally be 50 minutes this time. But anyway, it's been a couple of days since I wrapped things up and my god I want to talk about it so let's just, let's just jump right in. <laughs> also check out this hat that my mom got me. It, it doesn't quite look like the, the straw hat, but it's close enough, and I, I, I don't know if I, I'm gonna wear it. I'm gonna wear it. I like it. I, well, I, maybe I'll take it off later. First things first, someone left a comment about Senior Pink on my last video after I talked about my confusion, uh, his appearance changing, and Jesus Christ, Senior Pink might be the biggest Chad in the series. How are you going to go from being the goofiest goofball looking guy of all time, throwing diaper bombs at dudes, to being the manliest man in the history of the world? In three pages, dude! I literally got tears in my eyes. And this random character, this random side character, who should never have had, by all rights, should never have even had a backstory explored, because... Usually when Oda introduces a character that looks as goofy as Senior Pink, they're goofy just for the sake of being goofy. They're kind of a throwaway. And instead, Oda decides to give him the, the most incredible little two-page backstory arc that... Oh, dude. Senior Pink. Only Oda can introduce a character, give you... A minimum amount of time to understand why they are the way they are, you know? And, and in his case, it's incredibly sad. He, he lost his, his child and then his wife went catatonic and she only smiles when he wears a baby outfit. So he wears it all the time. This is the mark of a true man. But in all seriousness, I really love when Oda does this kind of stuff. When he throws something so wacky, so out there, and then he somehow makes you care about it. And I, I talked about this in just previous episodes. He has done that so well with Dressrosa as a whole. It just fleshes out the world of One Piece so well when you can have all these wacky looking characters and giving a backstory to even just one of them. So having that backstory for Senior Pink, despite it only being two pages, it makes the entire world feel a little more populated because now when I see other wacky characters, it feels like there's a story there somewhere, you know what I mean? Like, because normally those characters would just be there for the sake of a gag or so, you know, that's what they would exist for. But knowing that just one of them has this deeper meaning to their physical appearance makes me believe that a lot of these characters probably have their own backstory that there just isn't enough time to explore, which, and that one simple move just makes the entire world sort of expand in this really cool way. But anyway, I, I see what everyone means now. Senior Pink is fucking great, dude. I, I love him. <laughs> Among the other fights that happened before the big showdown at the end, I loved when Zoro got fucking catapulted at Pika and then sliced him in half, turned in midair, and sliced him in half again. And it's just this giant mountain of stone falling down on everyone. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Zoro is such a badass, man. Every time that he fights, I goosebumps, goosebumps. Also cool to see how Zoro learned hockey from Mihawk. And actually, this is an element of the story that I've really enjoyed overall about all the characters' times that they spent uh, uh, th in the two-year time gap uh, that we haven't really seen what they did. I mean, we got like a glimpse into what Sanji did. We've gotten a glimpse into what Zoro did. The rest of them, we don't r truly know what they were doing during that time. Like, we haven't seen anything specific. We just have like a general idea. So I love that... Because of that, we aren't introduced to all of their upgrades and all of the things that they've learned in that time. It's kind of slowly being spoon-fed to us over time. So, like, we saw one of Zoro's attacks in Fishman Island, then another one 
in Punk Hazard, and then another one here in Dress Rosa. So we're slowly seeing how much they've progressed as characters. And then, you know, obviously with Usopp, he was clearly just on the precipice of unlocking hockey, you know, all, all sorts of stuff like that. So I think that's an interesting way of sort of feeding us the growth of these characters instead of just dumping it all at once. Lastly, before I just get into all the meat of what I really want to talk about, Luffy versus Bellamy, dude. Oh, that was supercharged with emotion. I was talking about Bellamy in the last episode, dude. I saw so this arc being set up and it was executed in a way that I didn't expect. He actually kind of went the opposite direction that I expected. And who would have thought, dude, who would have thought that Bellamy the hyena would give me such a strong reaction to, to, to his actions and his words. That fight with Luffy where he's like, if I'm going to be an idiot, I just have to follow through on it. And he was like, thank you for calling me a friend. I, I want to die at your hands because I'm so stupid and you've made me see the error of my ways. I know I followed the wrong man. Oh, Bellamy, man. Bellamy. Okay, I'm taking this hat off. I It's, it's itchy. <laughs> and Bellamy, in this weird way is a microcosm of what Doflamingo represents. Because when we first meet Bellamy, he's all about the strong will prevail. Being strong means that you're free from the, the restraints of society, like in this own weird way that he talks about this. And Doflamingo is that. He That's his one of his biggest philosophies, is that the strong deserve to, you know, survive. They're the ones that get to tell history, you know, you know stuff like that. And because Bellamy is weaker than Luffy and weaker than Doflamingo, he doesn't have that freedom. But he still held that belief, which is why he was willing to basically be Doflamingo's puppet. And I, I think that's so interesting that this character, who by all rights should have just been left behind in Jaya, ended up being representative of this overarching theme about Doflamingo's entire character arc. And you know what? Because I am too excited to talk about it, I really want to just jump into my thoughts overall about Doflamingo now that I'm done with Dressrosa. He is an excellent villain. The way that he has slowly unraveled to us throughout the course of this story is masterful because we meet him when, like way back when, like I, I think it was like in Skypea when we first meet him and we just got glimpses of him throughout the story, little bite-sized pieces of this character. And then he's he's been like almost like an onion. You just peel back the layers and you learn more and more and more about his role within the world. Because let's be honest, Doflamingo himself in the end wasn't actually all that powerful. I mean, he, he definitely was strong, but like Luffy was able to literally like one hit KO him with, with one of his stronger attacks. But that's not what made Doflamingo a great character, just as the fights in One Piece aren't what make One Piece great. But I will say, I think it was super interesting that Doflamingo had sort of ascended to this new level of fruit mastery where he was able to turn everything around him into strings. I'm assuming that that new kind of epoch of, or epoch, that's not the wrong word, apex of, of fruit mastery will become important in the future. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, I thought that was an interesting point. But as I said, that's not what made Doflamingo an interesting character was his power. What was interesting was that when we first meet him, all we know is that he's a warlord and he's kind of a little chaotic and he's got this sort of attitude about him that makes him feel like he's stronger or like above everyone else. And then you learn that he's this arms dealer with this like alias that sells things to the black market and that he's kind of got his hands in all these different wars. He's like this puppet master. And then you learn that he's a celestial dragon. And then you learn that he's sort of the center of a lot of the major events that are going on and a lot of the major entities within this world. He kind of sits as this swivel for all of them to be held together. And because of all this, he's made himself untouchable so that even though he himself isn't like overpowered strong he has so much around him that depends on him that it, it anyone apart from luffy or law someone with a lot of guts would have never even dared to challenge him because of how much hinges on him and he's got this way of ruthlessness and sort of manipulation and control that reminds me a lot of crocodile way back in alabasta obviously this is on a much grander scale than anything crocodile ever accomplished but they're the way that they controlled people and the way that they sort of 
were on the pinnacle of their empire was through a lot of the same means. And I think Doflamingo is a lot more effective at, at uh, portraying those things, but those similarities definitely exist in my mind. And I think this is just one of the many reasons that Doflamingo is such a great character, because especially once you understand his motivations and where he came from and how he became the person that he is, it adds all this weight to sort of his position within the world because by setting himself up into this position where he is essentially untouchable and where he believes that no one would ever dare to defy him, he's basically trying to prop himself up into the position he was born into as a celestial dragon. And he never accomplishes it, but he is trying essentially to put himself into that uh, into that high level seat where no one would ever want to get in his way. I also think that uh, the conversation he has after he's been captured with the Navy woman, that dude, chills. I got chills up and down my body where he's talking about how he's basically explaining how his removal is going to set off this enormous chain reaction of events where all these different people that were depending on him for this or that and that he had sort of maintained this delicate balance throughout all these different entities are now going to be kind of looking around like, well, what now? And he talks about how the situation was already precarious and now there's going to be a landslide of events because there is no pirate king right now. Whitebeard never sat on that throne after Goldie Roger. There's the four emperors out there. There's the worst generation coming in. The Navy is in turmoil. There's so much going on. And I love, love, love that, that line there at the end where he's chained up. And I, his whole attitude was great where he's just kind of laughing and he, he doesn't seem like he's been captured. Like his attitude is not the attitude of someone who's been captured but the line where he says just give me a newspaper that'll keep me entertained for as long as i'm down in empel down what a great speech to me that was up there with his marine ford speech in terms of just how impactful it was and how powerful his words were i love love the way that he talks and i keep saying i keep repeating that i love things right now but man dude the end of this arc was just fantastically done up until the end of Dressrosa, I was feeling good about it. it. It wasn't like my favorite arc by any means, but I, what, it was missing something. It was missing something that I felt in, you know, Water 7 Ennies Lobby, Marine Ford. Like, it wasn't on that S tier level. I don't know if it is still. I, I, I need to sit with it a little bit longer, but the ending really brought things together for me in a way that I, it worked super well. Because what the end of this arc did was bring together all of the social and political ramifications of the actions of our characters. Within the story itself, there was, of course, the political ramifications within Dressrosa, but what makes One Piece great is seeing how the actions of the Straw Hat crew impact the world as a whole. That is where One Piece shines for me, and the end of Dressrosa is when all that starts to tie back in in an amazing way. But let me back up real quick to when Luffy goes into gear four. It's a great moment. Uh, Oda is, he's always goofy with this kind of stuff. I, I think it's hilarious that Luffy, when he's in gear four, he just kind of bounces around like a balloon. Like he can't really control. He's just, he's just hopping up and down. That It's a funny little touch there. I think that the way he looks is simultaneously goofy and also kind of intimidating and scary and it creates this size difference in him that is kind of cool like he's he's definitely way more intimidating but it's it's at the same time goofy his king kong punch was badass where he kind of suction cups his arm back in on itself and then releases that was awesome and when he one hit ko'd do flamingo that was that was awesome and he like shatters the city and there's a shockwave oh Dude, Gear 4 rocks, dude. I still think that the reveal of Gear 2 is the coolest reveal of any of the gears so far. Probably just because it was the first reveal, but Gear 4 is definitely badass. That he can harden his body and also have the elasticity of the rubber. Is it, It's definitely a little overpowered, but I'm assuming that he's probably about to meet characters that counter him pretty well on that. And even before Gear 4, the best moment of the fight, in my opinion, against Doflamingo was after Law gets his fucking arm cut off, which that was by far the, the, like the most gruesome injury that someone's uh, suffered on page so far, at least as far as I can remember. But the moment where Law is on the ground and Luffy comes back up on the roof and he, def and he blocks 
Dofi's foot with his own foot. And it's, I don't know what it is about that panel. That was so great. It's just like the size difference between them and the way that he's able to just stop him in his tracks. I don't know what it was. And then they just kind of glare at each other. Dude, I, I love those moments with Luffy where he steps up to someone who by all rights is, you know, looks at least way more powerful than him. And he just stares him down with this intensity. It always works. And it shouldn't be working at this point. We're at chapter 800. It shouldn't be having that effect on me anymore, but it does. It does because Oda, he has the Krabby Patty secret formula for those moments. <laughs> Ooh, another thing that I, I talked about briefly in the last episode, but I want to expand upon now is the op-op fruit and the fact that it can grant someone immort immortality at the life of the user. And that got me thinking, how would they know that unless someone has already been granted immortality? There's gotta be someone in the One Piece world that is immortal, that is walking around, that we will meet eventually, right? Otherwise, how would they know that that's possible? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Another sort of side thing that I wanna talk about right now is Jimbei's cover stories where he's, you know, helping this town that was destroyed because the sea, the sea monsters threw like these ancient ruins on the city, but he finds a Pone glyph. And anytime I see a Pone glyph, I start having a little nerdgasm because those are some of the most interesting things in the entire world of One Piece. I really hope we find out what was written on that Pone glyph because my God, this is another thing this is another thing. At this point, we have heard about the will of D so many goddamn fucking times. I want to know what it means because we got like the brief sort of half explanation from Korra in the flashback where he's like, oh, they're the enemies of the gods. But then Doflamingo, when he's fighting Law, is like, oh, he probably didn't know what he was talking about. So that means that potentially we didn't even get the correct information there. I want to know that at this point, that mystery has been around for so long and has been talked about so much. I want answers. I want answers. <laughs> the most I can surmise is that somehow those with the will of D are, are descendants of people who at one point were at war with the celestial dragons. Potentially, I could be wrong even remotely right but that's sort of what i'm guessing uh don't tell me if i'm right i'm probably so wrong but i feel like i might be on the right track i don't know i my brain doesn't work in this way <laughs> Anyway, there's just a few more things that I really want to talk about. First off, Sabo's like little flashback where we see that he had memory loss from when he got fucking decimated by a fucking uh, a Navy ship where he got set, banished to the fucking Shadow Realm. Uh, he, he lost his memory for a while and that's why he never reunited with the guys. And it's pretty fucking sad that it, uh, it took fucking Ace's obituary to, to make him stop being a memory loss boy. That was quite the sentence right there. <laughs> Man, I just want to give Sabo a hug. Like that that boy, that boy deserves the world. I love him. <laughs> One of the emotional highs for me was uh, Kairos and Rebecca reuniting at the very end when uh, when Luffy sort of brings her to him and everyone thinks that he kidnapped Rebecca. Um, that was an emotional high point for me. Uh, it was executed so well. And I, I just... Oh. Kairos is a man's man. And now I got to talk about my boy, Fujitora. This man, to me, is a total parallel uh, to Luffy in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, not, it's not a perfect parallel, but he is absolutely very similar in the way that he represents their respective group that he is a part of in the same way that Luffy does as sort of this outlier of, like, chaotic good or, like, lawful good. I, I don't know exactly. I don't know the alignment chart very well. Because <laughs> in my mind, the pirates, as a generalization, are thought of as sort of uh, you know, fear-mongering, lawless, evil, selfish people that go around looting and murdering and, you know, finding treasure and they're these, you know, not great people. And on the other hand, the Navy is sort of thought of this as this iron fist that is going to go strike down their enemies with ruthlessness and enforce peace through any means possible. But on the pirate side, Luffy is clearly, uh, you know, like one of the best people in the entire world. He's all about freedom and loving people and kindness and sort of, you know, doing the right thing no matter what. And Fujitora on the other side isn't necessarily about coming down with an iron fist. It's about 
the safety of the people and about respect and about doing the right thing based on what you see and experience rather than what you're told to do. That fight between Fujitora and Luffy is fantastic where Luffy is calling out all his hits. He's like, I'm going to kick you now. I'm going to punch you now. And Fujitora is like, what are you doing? And Luffy's like, you're a good guy. I don't want to fight you while you're blind. It's just such a funny, funny moment there. And going back before then, Fujitora literally bowing down and apologizing on behalf of the Navy and it's broadcast everywhere. And then the reaction of the Navy headquarters when they see all this happening, Akainu's anger and, and the fact that Fujitora, despite all this, does not care. He, he is going to do the right thing. He is 10 out of 10. He is the best Navy man so far. And then he ends up actually assisting them as all the pirates are trying to leave and they're being pursued. And he throw, dude, by the way, holy shit. He was able to pick up literally all the rubble. It darkens the sky. That is, that is some packing power right there, dude. That is insane. I hadn't really seen him use power that was on the level of an admiral up until that point. But at that point, I was like, God damn, I understand now. And yet another emotional high point that comes right after that is when all the pirates are pledging their allegiance to Luffy. And he's like, I don't want any of that. I don't want to be some big shot. I just want to go sail the seven seas and become the pirate king. And that, of course, makes so much sense because Luffy is all about the freedom. It's never been about power or status to him. But they, all the pirates just don't understand that. But they, they respect him enough that they're like, well, we're going to follow you anyway. You don't have to be our, our, our daddy or whatever, whatever, they, whatever the status is that they want him to drink the cup. But they're like, we're going to follow you anyway. We're going to be at your beck and call. It's a shonen trope when, when the protagonist is able to kind of have people follow them just based off of, you know, the, the, his upright moral and, and status, and, you know, that's and his inspirational personality. But it just it's always so awesome when it's done like that. And now the Straw Hat Empire has grown, which is awesome. It's just been super cool to see the way that Luffy's uh, notoriety has grown over time. Where he, you know, looking back at the beginning of the series, he literally has this tiny little, like, dingy boat. And now he has not only his own crew and giant boat, he has, like, a whole fucking army at his back. And just the growth over time is, ah, it's just so well done. And it's just been paced super well. And now he has all these people you know, at his back that, that are willing to go to bat for him. And it's, it's a great moment where they're all like, they all hold their cups up. And then also super funny that Zoro just is like, I'm going to drink all this myself because obviously Luffy's not going to take it. Two small things before I get to the end here. Um, Usopp has a $200 million bounty. Oh my God. <laughs> Literally. Oh my God. Usopp. <laughs> this one incident has made Usopp one of the most wanted men on the crew. Fucking hilarious. Also, I don't know if this is going to come into play like soon or, or what, but when they saw their wanted posters, Sanji said that he's wanted alive, not dead or alive. What? KS, what is that? What does that mean? I really hope this isn't just like another dangling mystery that won't be resolved for a while. I'm crossing my fingers that i'll find out what that is soon because god damn it there's already enough mysteries dude <laughs> but the last thing that i need to talk about before i wrap this video up is kaido's introduction i've been hearing about this character for what like 400 chapters uh, maybe even more at this point and we finally get to see him and he is terrifying his introduction is insane where he it just builds up for like half a chapter where there you see this guy up on on this sky island and you're like well who the fuck is this what is he, what's going on and then they slowly sort of unravel what's going on there because then they, they show you all the worst generation pirates that have sort of teamed up and also you find out that they're going after shanks which you stay away from my boy shanks you leave him alone that you leave Shanks alone. But anyway, they're all gathered at this island. And then they just, there's this giant collision. And they look down or like something just fell out of the sky. And you and then there's this slowly, I think it's like three pages where it's like the man, he, he let himself be captured 18 times. He's had 
you know, 20 swords break on the back of his neck and he's been trying to find a way to die for however many years. But he, his favorite hobby, his favorite hobby now is trying to commit suicide and they call him Kaido, King of the Beasts. And he towers over all the other people around him and they say that he is the most powerful creature alive. Man, what an intro, dude. What an amazing intro for that character. I don't know what role he's going to play. He's been built up now to be this insanely powerful person that I genuinely, I, I don't know what to expect from him. I don't know what he's going to be like. I, I Like, a really interesting way to introduce him here, where he literally wants to kill himself and he can't find out a way to do it. He's that strong. He literally cannot even kill himself. That is a crazy way to introduce someone. And my my level, my expectation levels have skyrocketed for that character. And I, dude, dude, that is, that is some heat right there. Anyway, that's about all my thoughts for this wrap up of Dressrosa. I haven't been talking nearly as long as last time. So hopefully this video will be shorter than the last one. Anyway, Dressrosa was fantastic. I, I still don't know where it sits on sort of my overall you know, like arc tier list that I'm building in my brain, but I'm sure I'll settle on something eventually. I thought it was executed amazingly, especially at the end. Everything kind of came together. And there were a couple moments where maybe it could have been a little bit shortened, but the pacing felt great to me. I had seen something about someone complaining about the pacing. I don't know if that's like an anime only thing because it felt fine in the manga. I was trying to th see what people were saying about that. But honestly, I, th I thought that it just ran super smoothly and the ending really brought things together in a way that made me f end on a really high note with this arc. Anyway, um, I think the next arc is the zoo arc. I like looked it up. Uh, I don't know if that's how you say it, zoo or whatnot, but it's like 20 chapters. So it's not going to take me long to read and get that video out. So expect that soon. And until next time, I hope you're taking care of yourself. I hope you're happy and healthy and I'll see you then.